everybody. Welcome back to the Fire It Up with CJ show. I'm talking to Elizabeth Lesser, and we're talking about her book, Cassandra Speaks, When Women Are Storytellers. And in part one, we had ended talking about, you know, what happens when women are in leadership? What does power actually look like? And what does it involve? And so um, I want to go back into um, the continuing the um, idea of power. So when you think about women and power, what do you think it really means? Because you've studied this a great deal. What do you think it means? Well, about 20 years ago, I started asking myself that because I had been in a leadership position for years, but I noticed that just the fact that I wanted to be in leadership and that I wanted power made me feel ashamed and embarrassed. Like I would mm. never admit to anyone that I was a woman who wanted power. Mm. It just seemed like a dirty word for mm. a woman to even admit. And I realized, well, I don't want the kind of power that's corrupted power. I don't wanna dominate other people. I don't wanna use fear to get what I want. I want to include, I want to have a different kind of power. I want inclusive power. I want to help the people who are working on my teams become so great themselves that they'd want to leave my organization and start their own. Like I have a whole other different idea of power, but it was not merging well. You used the metaphor in the last um, segment that that sometimes in leadership, women feel like you're merging, you're in a lane and you're merging and you have to like merge in, and then suddenly you've lost yourself. So right. I decided to create a conference. I was just gonna create one conference because I was in the conference creating business. Mm -hmm. And I had done a lot of conferences like on, let's say holistic health or creativity. And I would just do one big conference and invite a lot of famous speakers and that'd be it. So I decided I'm going to put these two words together, women and power, and just call that the conference and ask the question, why does this make us so uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Women, men, culture, everyone. And I invited a few people who at that stage back 20 years ago were household names, Anita Hill, who had mm -hmm. recently mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. been in, in the uh, Clarence Thomas hearings for him to become justice uh, in the Supreme Court. And she had dared to say, I don't know if a man who sexually uh, harassed me and other women deserves in the, this role. No one had even heard that word before. She was the person who brought the mm. idea of harassment mm. into the vernacular. So I thought she'd be a good person to talk about what does it mean? to seize some kind of power and then to be shamed in front of the whole country on television. And I invited uh, Eve Ensler who wrote the vagina monologues. Mm. She dared to say the word vagina uh, in, on Broadway. And Iyana Levanzant, who wasn't that well known at the time, a lawyer and a television host. Anyway, and a couple of other women. And I was surprised hundreds of women came to this conference mm. to share their discomfort. And then the next year I did it again. And it's, I still do this conference every mm -hmm. other year, Women and Power. And I, one year <clears throat> I decided to invite all the living um, Nobel Peace Prize winners. Wow. And I thought, and you may think, well, how would they all fit on a stage? Well, at that time, there were only five of them, even though there were hundreds of Nobel Prize wow. winners. And two of them couldn't come because they were under house arrest in Iran and Myanmar. Oh my God. But three of them came, and one of them, Jody Williams from the US, had actually walked across fields in countries where they had used landmines as weapons of war in front of warlords to say, I'm gonna keep wa walking and an American woman's gonna be blown up if you don't come to the peace table with me. So she was so brave and so powerful 
and she was being interviewed on the stage uh, by Pat Mitchell, who at that point was the CEO of PBS. And Pat said to Jody, how did you get so powerful? And Jody said, I don't like the word power. I'm not powerful. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much Pat would say, but you are powerful. What if it's a different kind of power? She was like, no, I don't like the word power. Mm -hmm. And it made me really think we have to own the word power, women, mm -hmm. in a different way. We have to say, even in a meeting where you're not being heard, where guys are talking over you, somehow we have to gain the dignity of our own idea of what power means and the willingness to say, hold up dudes, I'm speaking and I'm gonna speak in whatever tone I want. And it doesn't mean I'm either too intense or I'm mousy. Forget about what my voice sounds like, okay? Stop talking over me. I have something to say and our company needs it. Our company needs what I know in my bones. And I'd like you to listen. Mm. And it's time you all listen to all the women in your life because mm. we have something that's been denied the world for centuries. And it's time for us to speak it and for you to listen. Mm. And that is so hard for us to do. It's mm -hmm. so hard. I can hear myself saying it and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that. But I know I'm constantly feel challenged, but I'm constantly getting out of my comfort zone and speaking up for my value system. Yeah. You know, I had a, an example like this yesterday. I was in actually a mindful networking group, if you can imagine such a thing. And yes, I, I was talking about my um, experience as an Asian American and having the six women from Atlanta being killed and ha and my my pro my literally my spiritual practice as I've navigated through all of it and you know explaining how I was re-traumatized and how I'm not at a place of forgiveness and I, I just I can't authentically be there and um, I had these other mindful people who were you know, expertly forcing me to be in forgiveness. And I thought, you know, I, I know, I know that forgiveness is a, a logical you know, step towards love. I'm just not there yet. But it was actually um, a man and a woman trying to get me to feel forgiveness when I was not really feeling forgiveness. And I was like, I know, I actually teach this stuff too. So I understand the merits of forgiveness. But how can you not, why can't you just let me rest into the feeling? And this is what, if I was thinking like, what would I have said if I could have said at the moment? Cause I was so taken back at that moment of not being allowed whatever my feelings were. And, you know, I, I, I said, and I got defensive and said, I said, well, I, I actually understand the merits of forgiveness. It's that I'm not authentically feeling it. So if I'm not authentically feeling it, I'm not. And, you know, <laughs> but we, you know, we had to close the session, but it was one of those things that was just so tension field because you have women and men trying to mansplain things. <laughs> it was that's, just so that's such a good point because the, the feminine principle, it's a hard word. I put it in air quotes because there's so much baggage with the word feminine and masculine, but women have internalized uh, the, the supremacy of the male yes. ways as much as men have. And there are some men, like I told you before we went on air that I'm here visiting my son and daughter-in-law and my son, they just had a baby. And my son, as all, I have three sons, all of them are the most, caring and natural, nurturing fathers. And I actually think this is one of the things that's going to change the world is the way fathers are taking on fatherhood now and mm -hmm. showing their children that it is manly to love and nurture and care and choose sometimes to leave work for a while to take care of the baby so the wife can go work and in, in 
all kinds of um, same-sex marriages. The way we're mixing it up, especially in parenting, to me, is going to bring the feminine values into the power dynamic um, in beautiful, natural ways. Yeah, I am. Um, luckily, I am married to um, a husband that is like that. And so therefore, we've raised two boys that are like that as well. And um, however hard it is for them sometimes to actually live in a world that hasn't quite transitioned yet to right. um, a man ex man expressing kind of a holistic balanced feminine and masculine aspect. Um, it's, I feel very um, lucky to have men like that in my life. And, and, you know, I shared that to my husband. He's like, oh my gosh, you know, this is just, you know, I couldn't be allowed to have my feelings um, well, thing, in, in this mindful group. <laughs> I, one thing I might've done that might've worked, I might've said, probably in the moment, I would have been just like you, just like, oh no. But in retrospect, say, um, why is it so important to you that I have the same experience right now that you're having? Why is yeah. that so important? Mm. Um, yeah. Because I think in all relationships, this obsession we have that the other person's having the our exact experience, whether it's a marriage or a colleagueship or what we're seeing now with Black Lives Matter and what's happening with the Asian community now, it's like, we don't all have the same experience. Mm -hmm. We don't, women don't, different races don't, different ethnic groups don't. We have to, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a cliche, walk a mile in the other person's shoes, but, and believe that that other group's experience is real and right. valid and not the same as yours, mm -hmm. it just isn't. So live for a while in someone saying, I believe in forgiveness, I'm not ready. The mindful answer would be, that's okay. I'm standing with you until you are, period. Be right. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because it goes back to, um, you know, definitions of power as we societally define it, right? It's to subjugate me into being in forgiveness, punish me. You know, there is this kind of judgment, like if you're mindful, then you should realize that you should be in forgiveness and love um, or annihilate, you know, it's just trying to silence. You know, I couldn't actually, after this whole forgiveness train went along, I couldn't even get in a word in edgewise because there's other people adding to this whole idea of forgiveness. It's so funny. It's, it's almost hilarious. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like, where's the love in this conversation? I'm not sure, but it's okay. <laughs> but like going back to how you defined it as energy, freedom, an authority to be who we are. Like that's exactly the power, right? To the power to be on our path, authentically on our path, wherever we may be, whether I'm angry, you know, loving, unforgiving, you know, whatever it may be. It's like where we are right now in the moment, which is, I think the mindful. <laughs> well, I teach a mindfulness exercise and I can talk about it, if not in this segment, another. Yeah, tell us. Is it the one that, what do we, tell me about the exercise. Do no harm, but take no shit. Yes. <laughs> and that has gotten me, I've internalized this practice now. Mm. And it has gotten me out of, it has given me my voice. Mm. Because I can just, uh, I use hand motions with it that you see the Buddha doing. Mm -hmm. uh, these statues yeah. where the Buddha has one hand in the stop motion and one like a cup yeah. holding the tears of the world and I can feel into my body what's being called of me now to take no shit to have a strong backbone or am I more being called to listen and, to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and most of the time the answer is both you can be 
warm, open, and compassionate. Even as you protect yourself and, and take no shit, you can do both at the same time. Just because you say, I'm not ready to forgive, doesn't mean you're going to hurt anybody. Right. Just let me have my experience until I'm ready. I'm not going to go out and aggress on anyone. That's not what not forgiving means. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a contract you're making with yourself. I'm not ready yet to let this go. I have more to learn. Mm -hmm. I have more to metabolize. I, I trust myself enough to know I'm not going to use this fury and rage to hurt anyone, but I'm going to use it so I commit to transformation in myself and others, but give me time. Right, in an authentic way, like it's not going to be forcing me to your ideology at this point, even because I actually have the same ideology, not surprisingly, but I can't do it right now. So, you know, let me hold this. So you're saying the do no harm, but take no shit is kind of like, tell me how you would use this, like how you've recently used this in your own life. Well, um, or can you walk us through the meditation? I'm not sure what the I process is. I will walk is. you through the meditation. Okay. You know okay. In most of um, religious iconography, whether it's the Buddha or St. Francis or um, Joan of Arc, you always, they always have a straight backbone. Mm -hmm. Always this sense of dignity, almost like you're riding a horse and you're balanced and you're strong. You know that saying we say, I've got your back. It's mm -hmm. like, I've got my own back. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. regal, royal. I belong here. But at the same time, your shoulders are dropped. Your belly is soft. Your heart is wide open. So it's strong back, soft front. Mm. That, and when people say to me, what's meditation? I'll often say, if all you get is that, that you can have a strong, dignified presence mm -hmm. and a soft and open heart at the same time. If you can figure that out, that's meditation. Mm -hmm. And then adding these hands, which is like, I have boundaries. I know that my voice is important. You won't walk over me or talk over me because I'm valid too. Now for marginalized communities, this is such an important developmental stage in cultures that have said you, you're not important. So this sense of like, people wonder like, why do they have to be so intense? Of course the voice matters. No, it's been so long where it's not mm -hmm. mattered. Mm -hmm. this, this may be all you can do for a while, but always with this other hand, this sense that like, I feel the world. I'm part of this whole suffering mass. It's not just me who needs this voice. We're all in this together. Both these things are true. To live in this paradox of needing boundaries but needing to be open. This is the challenge of life. This is it. And sometimes I'll go into a meeting, I'll put my hands under the table and I'll ask myself, do I need to have more of a kind of push, no, listen to me, energy, or am I being aggressive asshole myself and I need mm -hmm. to listen more? Most of the time it's like, have a strong backbone and have an open heart and trust that you'll know when to speak and when to listen. But a lot of times I'll be like, no, I'm doing this, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's almost um, what I'm what I'm loving about that um, meditation is that it is um, very much about embodiment. Like you're putting the hand positions in your feeling in your body what it feels like to be strong and of authority, and while at the same time. I'm, when you said it, at least I was managing my heart and my belly being open, you know, so it's like, how can I let 
my body be soft in the front and and it's a very embodied and sensing oriented way of feeling power which is so um, most people would describe as I think is a more feminine way of like because what are you feeling into you're simultaneously feeling into your own when I was doing it, it's like you're simultaneously feel, feeling your own inner experience, your own inner power and wisdom about it, while at the same time recognizing that you're interrelating with other people. Yeah. So how do you create this balance, right, between, you know, because there's, you know, if, if you think about the Taoist way, which is another um leadership manual there is this there is the way there is the thing that is happening in the flow of life at the moment and so do you stop it like you know do you stop it like a mountain or do you allow it like water to flow and so this to me seems like an kind of a external like feeling into like instead of this being kind of like a I, I don't know when I was thinking about it, it's like, if this were like, I'm in nature now and I'm feeling into what wants to happen. That's what Tai Chi is. Yeah, it's just, this it's feels awesome. like, ah, like I'm now feeling like what wants to happen at this present moment, not what CJ feels like should happen to defend my ego, but it's like, what, what wants to happen at this because this like moment. Your, your your puzzlement that how could within a mindfulness call people be <laughs> forcing upon me a sense of forgiveness well sometimes spiritual seekers all we are is this you know we think yeah mistake that like we're supposed to be open and vulnerable and soft all the time uh, no negativity, no strength, no backbone, like only forgiveness, only a certain type of love. Well, you'll get run over. And, and the sacred warrior who knows her worth and, mm -hmm. and knows what is worth defending in life and knows her own heart and soul that's a very important developmental stage mm. and if all your spiritual practice is doing is making you more and more sensitive the world is a hard place to live in and yeah so, you know i have a friend who was part of the south african truth and reconciliation commission in after apartheid ended and the country instead of going into civil war chose a path of forgiveness, but mm. they didn't just have everybody nicey, nicey, forgive each other. It was a structure. It was a way of doing it. And no one was asked to do it before they were ready. And the perpetrators had to apologize with true authenticity, had to sit there in front of the victim's entire family and say, yes, I did that. Mm. I did that. I beg for your apology. I am deeply remorseful. Mm. I commit to changing. There were all sorts of rules in it and the way it was heard. And Bishop Tutu said- Yeah, powerful. That when that happened in the room, when true forgiveness happened, not just phony voicing it, they all stopped. He made them stop. And he would say, we're on holy ground here. No, beautiful. Wow. That's really beautiful. Wow. That's just touched my heart. Um, I have one more observation about this exercise that I love, by the way. <laughs> um, what I love about this, I'm, I'm bringing a Taoist perspective on this, is that you have fire and water, you know, fire, flame, and water. And this is really the ultimate expression, right, of feminine and masculine. You know, you have two energies that are coming together and you're just feeling into the energies that are actually within you, but externally expressed. And so what is it? Is it the fire of fierceness? Like, no, we cannot do that. You're like, stop everyone. Let's meditate. Or 
ah, you know, let's, you know, go into your heart and feel true forgiveness. You know, it's this feminine, it, that in some ways is a, a very authentic expression of the feminine and masculine and, and feeling into what aspect wants to happen. That is like my, one of my all-time favorite exercises. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. We've been talking to Elizabeth Lesser. Um, Cassandra speaks when women are storytellers. And um, you mentioned in the previous segment, um, what are our shadows? Um, and I want to talk a little bit about our shadows and our dreams in our next segment. Thank you so much.